All right, get your Bibles out and ready because we're going to go quickly through the entire Bible. Yes, I said the entire Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, God has said a lot about worship. I'm going to make it somewhat easy. I've got six points. Now, I'm gonna, that shows you how fast we're going to go in a 15-minute Bible study or 20-minute maybe. Uh, six topics that we'll cover. Easy to remember. Adam and Eve then Abraham and Isaac, and then Moses and Aaron, and then David and Solomon, and then jumping to the New Testament to Jesus and the apostles, and lastly to you and me. So we start at the beginning with Adam and Eve. In Genesis 2.15, turn to Genesis 2. Genesis 2.15, we read, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. It sounds simple enough, but there are some interesting words that are used in this simple sentence. For example, the word put in the Hebrew is not the most common word that is used in the Hebrew for put. It's also interesting that when you go to Ex Exodus 16, Exodus 16:33, we read there that Moses instructed Aaron. You might want to turn there, Exodus 16:33. Moses instructed Aaron to take a jar and put an omer of manna in it. Now, that's the common word for put. That's what you would expect to be used. That take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord. That's the word that we have in Genesis 2, to place it before the Lord. When something was placed, was set before the Lord, it was an act of worship. For example, in Deuteronomy 26.10, we read, And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground of which you, O Lord, have given me, and you, will, and you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before the Lord your God. There it is. To set it down is the same word that is used of Adam. God set Adam in the garden to worship him. And that brings us to the other interesting word in Genesis Two. So go back to Genesis 2, 15. Adam was set in the garden to do what? To work it and to keep it. The word work is also used throughout the Old Testament to mean to serve or to minister. Adam worshiped God by being placed in the garden to serve God, to do the work that God, to minister on behalf of God within the context of the garden. All right, let's jump to Abraham and to Isaac. You know the story of Abraham and Isaac. You know in Genesis 22 that God told Abraham to take his son, his only son, and to offer him as a sacrifice on the mountain. And Abraham believed God. He obeyed God. Now in verse 5 of Genesis 22, it's tempting to only emphasize the greatness of Abraham's faith. And it should be emphasized. Abraham believed God. He believed that God would keep his child, that, would, that, would, that God would be faithful to his promise. Abraham believed God. It's a tremendous demonstration of faith. But I also want us to see something else in verse 5. Look what Abraham says to the servants. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Now, obviously, he believed God's promise. And we saw in Hebrews a few months ago that we're told that he trusted God so deeply that he believed God would raise Isaac from the dead. He was going to sacrifice his son, believing that God would raise him from the dead because God keeps his promises. But it's also important that he said that we are going up to worship God. What did he mean? I, well, I seriously doubt that Abraham meant that he and Isaac were going to go up on the mountain and have a, a hymn sing. What did Abraham mean when he told the servants that the boy and I are going up on the mountain to worship God and we'll come back to you? Well, by his actions, we can see what he meant. He was obeying God by placing his son upon the altar as an offering to God. Worship to Abraham, or in this case with Abraham, means that he is obeying God and offering to God. Simple obedience as well as offering what God requires. Abraham worshipped God by his obedience 
and by presenting the offering that God required of him. Now let's jump to Moses and Aaron. When we come to Moses and Aaron, there are obviously many, many, many chapters that deal with worship. It was Moses or through Moses that God really organized worship and organized his people in a corporate assembly like, like never before. So there's so many different places and chapters and books that we could look at. However, I wanted to just take us to one that is, that is very sobering. Turn to Leviticus chapter 10. And it is in Leviticus 10 that we meet once again Aaron's sons. Remember Nadab and Abihu? Not exactly common names to name your sons today, and you probably wouldn't want to given their story, but Nadab and Abihu. Now this isn't the first time that we meet them in God's holy word. Back in Exodus 24, I wanna look back there, that's a very interesting chapter. Exodus 24, they are with Moses and Aaron up on the mountain, and they get to see God. Uh, I must admit, that is a very confusing passage to me. Uh, it, it stuns me when I read this because it tells us without any apology or, or explanation, really, that these people get to see God. Nadab and Abihu, with Moses and Aaron and the 70 elders of Israel, go up the mountain. And God reveals himself. You can read that in, in more detail, but that's, that's a whole other sermon for, for another time. And, and boy, that, I look forward to that one. For now, I bring this up simply to show you that these were not ignorant men. Nadab and Abihu were not ignorant as to God's requirements and who God is. They saw God. They saw the glory of God. They were not ignorant men. They met him and they knew what pleased God when it comes to worshiping him and presenting offerings to God. So fast forward back to Leviticus 10. And we see Nadab and Abihu present an offering to God that is not authorized. And you'll know what I mean by that in a moment. Look at verses 1 through 3. Leviticus 10 Verses 1 through 3. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will will be sanctified and before all the people I will be glorified and Aaron held his peace on this passage R.C. Sproul once wrote this grim episode in the history of ancient Israel makes an unforgettable point worshiping the living God is serious business it is not something to be trifled with or taken lightly God is serious about how we worship him, and we must be serious about it too. So we've seen Adam and Eve. They were placed by God in the, in the garden to work it, to obey him and serve him. With Abraham and Isaac, we saw once again an element of worship is to obey God and to present an offering to God. And now through Moses and Aaron, we see how serious God takes worship. And we are to worship him as he commands. Goes pretty hard words for our contemporary churches today, our, our, our churches around us today that are worshiping as they desire. To please people, to entertain men. Our God is a consuming fire. The worship of God is serious business. So we've seen Adam and Eve, Abraham and Isaac, Moses and Aaron. Now let's go to David and Solomon. And when we come to David and Solomon, like Moses and Aaron, we have a tremendous amount of material in the Old Testament on the topic of worship as these two men, his father and son, have the privilege 
of building the temple for God, for the corporate worship of God's people. But for the sake of time, let's just go to 1 Chronicles chapter 16 in verses 8 through 12, where we can see four aspects of worship under King David. First, in verse 8, we see the importance of proclamation. Now, this is the first time we're going to get into a few elements of the worship service that we see through David. In verse 8, we see the importance of proclamation. Verse 8 of First Chronicles 16. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Within the context of public worship, the proclamation of God's marvelous deeds is of utmost importance. To proclaim his glory, to proclaim what he has done, to give thanks to him. And then in verse 9, we see that we are to sing to him. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Now, unfortunately, in our day, the word worship has basically taken on this word simply as its meaning. That worship means to sing. The worship was wonderful today, or it's not my style of worship that I enjoy the most. It became and has become a synonym for singing. But singing is a vital element to the corporate worship of God. We are to come before him with proclamation and we are to sing, to sing praises to him. And then verse 10 and 11, the third element, we say that we are to seek him. Verse 10 and 11 says, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. You see, too often people come to worship God with their own agendas. To, to satisfy themselves. When we come to worship, we are to seek the Lord. On this pulpit, I don't think you can see it in, uh, from that distance, but right here in the middle, I have a quote from John 12, 21. When some people came to the apostles and they said, Sirs, we wish to see Jesus. I keep that there in front of me every Sunday so that I don't desire to be the focus of your worship. You come to see Jesus. You come to seek him. And I simply have the privilege of proclamation. Quentin has the privilege of helping you and leading you in singing. But our goal is that you would see Jesus, that you would seek him, and that would cause you to rejoice. And then fourthly, verse 12, we see that we are to remember and praise him for what he's done. Verse 12, remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments that he has uttered. This is part of what we do when we pray. We, we rehearse back to God what he has done, and we rejoice in his, in his goodness to us. There's so much more that we can consider about worship from the Old Testament but let's move into the New Testament and see what Jesus and the apostles taught. On one occasion, Jesus was teaching, or rather he was traveling with his disciples, and he sent them on into town, and he waited by a well for a Samaritan woman to come that she would be able to draw water. It was an odd time of day, and I won't get into all the details, and it'd be, a, again, another sermon on its own. But it was an odd time of day, and she would not, most of the women would come early in the morning, but this was in the heat of the day. She comes to the well to draw water, and Jesus, of course, we believe wholeheartedly in the sovereignty of God, and we understand that Jesus knew that this woman would be coming by herself to the well at that time of day, and he sent his disciples into the city so that he could have this private conversation with this Samaritan woman. No well-respected rabbi, Jewish rabbi, would be caught dead speaking to a woman, teaching a woman, and a Samaritan woman at that. 
So Jesus sends his disciples into town that he may begin to have this private conversation and see the salvation of this woman. Well, within their conversation, instead of getting into the, all the, the, the details of it, I want us to consider one verse in the middle of their conversation that, that Jesus reveals the true heart of worship. In John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. <clears throat> First, and, and I think most importantly, God is the object of our worship. Jesus wholeheartedly obeyed all Ten Commandments without hesitation, without stumbling. And clearly the first four deal with our, first five really, I think, deal with our relationship to our Heavenly Father. That we are to worship Him and Him alone. That we are to have no other gods before Him. And that means not in His physical proximity, but in his presence. And because God is always present everywhere, he alone is God. And Jesus demonstrates that, that our worship, we worship him. He is to be worshiped. But the point that we need to see is what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. John MacArthur said that to worship God in spirit means that a person must worship not simply by external conformity to religious rituals and places outwardly, but inwardly in the spirit with the proper heart attitude. Now this answers the woman's inquiry in the middle of that conversation that we didn't get into, I didn't read that part, but she inquired about whether God should be worshiped on their mountain in Samaria or in Jerusalem, on their mountain. And Jesus basically, to, to, to melt it all down, Jesus basically says, it's in your heart. It's not here nor there, but in spirit, in your spirit. That's not a reference to the Holy Spirit, and that's clear by the Greek, but in your spirit, in your heart, inwardly. This is the same response that God has always had toward external rituals without the heart. To worship in truth refers to worshiping God as God has revealed in his word. And it must be done in an honest and truthful way. So it has both of those components in a truthful, honest way, but also governed by the truth, by the revealed Word of God. We must not pretend to worship God. We must truly worship from the heart in integrity. But we must also follow his instructions in his word as to how we worship. And, and this leads us to the last point of you and me. I hope that through this rapid excursion through the Bible, that worship, you understand worship is far more than singing together on Sunday morning, but that we have been created to worship. We have been designed to worship. And so let's wrap it up with, with the, the five W's. Who, what, where, when, and why. The who is obvious, right? We are called to worship the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The what is also pretty obvious. Worship includes our hearts and our hands. When we worship, we honor or exalt God from the heart, but we also serve and obey God as he has commanded. We saw it with Abraham and Isaac. We can see, we could look at it with Moses and, and, and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu's failure to do so. We could see, we could have dug dig deeper into David and Solomon and we could have seen it there as well. But worship, the, the what of worship, includes both the heart and the hands. Honoring and exalting God, as well as serving and obeying God. When? Who? What? Where? No, where? You know, it doesn't appear to matter too much. 
where as long as the heart is involved. Thankfully, there is no central sanctuary for God. We're not called anywhere to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Oh, I would love some days, but it's on my bucket list. Someday I hope that I have the privilege of being able to go to Jerusalem, to go through Israel and, and to see these places where Jesus walked and where the Apostle Paul walked. I would love to go on one of the missionary journeys that Paul took. Uh, I would love that. But we are not called by God to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem as if that is the central sanctuary where the true worship of God happens. No, the where is in your heart. Wherever you may be, you may be able to worship God. Now, sadly, that oftentimes is used by people to say that we don't need to come to church. We can worship God as we fish on the lake. We can worship God on the golf course. We can worship God anywhere we are. And to a degree, that is true. Because it's in our heart that we worship God. But God has also called us to assemble together with his people in corporate assembly for the purpose of worship. So it's not an either or, and it's not do one to excuse not doing the other. We are called by God to gather with his people, but it can be in a house, it can be in a temple, it can be in a parking lot. You know what, that's something that I'm actually considering to, to discuss with the officers and, and look at the means. Some of the other churches around us are beginning to worship in their parking lots through a radio frequency, and, and maybe we need to do that as well someday. The where is in the heart, but there is also the call to meet together corporately. Who, what, where, when? Well, this is another mistake that a lot of people make, unfortunately, and I think that worship is merely an event that takes place on Sunday morning from 11 to 12, or for us, 10.30 to 2.30. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, the when, clearly worship, according to what we have seen in the Old Testament and with Jesus in the New Testament, is an everyday way of life. But God has called us to assemble together for corporate worship. So our win is at 1030 on Sunday mornings, but it should be every day as well. We seek to honor God and exalt God in everything that we do. We seek to obey God and serve him in everything that we do. Worship is an everyday 24-7 experience that includes an event on the Lord's Day. Now we come to the last W, why? All men worship something. We are created to worship. That's why God formed the Ten Commandments and, and specifically uh, commanded against idolatry because all men worship something or someone. Worship is what we were created to do. So why must we worship God? Because simply, the easy answer, God said so. <laughs> Don't you, did you hate that when you were a child and you asked your parents, why 